Hello. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to my sunny garden here in Järvenpää, Finland. My name is uh, Henrik Ingo and uh, I've invited you today to talk about a topic I've always been passionate about, copyleft licensing. So uh, <clears throat> for those that don't know me, uh, my uh, day job is the, in the database industry with open source databases. I work for Datastax where we develop and sell uh, Cassandra pre based product. And before that I worked many years with MongoDB and then with MySQL and MariaDB. Uh, and in terms of licensing, uh, data, uh, Cassandra is uh, an Apache licensed database, MongoDB for the most time I used AGPL when I was there uh, and MySQL of course is GPL licensed so I have some experience uh, working with these. Today uh, I want to talk about copyleft licensing and, and in particular uh, you know, about opportunities uh, where we might uh, for argument's sake uh, want to go beyond what uh, GPL and AGPL provide, and, uh, and I'm going to talk uh, uh, from three recent real examples, uh, the cryptographic autonomy license, which uh, has been recently approved by the OSI, uh, MongoDB's uh, server-side public license, which uh, was submitted to OSI but uh, never approved. Uh, and then the Facebook's uh, BSD plus patents clause, which never seriously attempted to become an open source license at all. So, uh, all right, let's start. <coughs> I, I think uh, probably everyone watching this talk knows uh, about the history of, of Richard Stallman and GPL, but I, I, I feel uh, the talk uh, would, would still be a miss if uh, I didn't quickly uh, go through the, the thought process that led to, to the GPL license. Uh, so, yeah, as, as we all know, in the 60s, 70s, when computer science and programming was invented, uh, basically uh, s software so and source code was freely available uh, and developed maybe mostly in academic circles first. Uh, and it was natural to kind of share what you had done uh, and then uh, also use others work just like you do in science uh, today as well and uh, but then 70s 80s we saw the rise of the first commercial software companies such as uh, the first unix vendors uh, and they realized that uh, they could uh, keep the source code to themselves uh, only publish binary programs uh, that they sell their customers and, and this way uh, nobody else could use the source code that they had produced uh, and uh, this uh, yeah th this led to development and uh, as also universities of course started using commercial operating systems for example uh, so there were people who, who were annoyed uh, by this development because now they no longer had access to, to the source code of the system they were using, they had become consumers uh, of a computer rather than developers who could, could uh, jointly uh, develop the software. Uh, so Stallman was one of these people, maybe he was more annoyed than most, I don't know, uh, I wasn't there at that time yet. The first reaction uh, that I've read about uh, by many has been that uh, ah, copyright is bad, we should fight copyright legislation uh, or it should not apply to software uh, kind of like uh, the pirate movement still uh, argues today uh, that, uh, that they b basically uh, declare that they're gonna ignore yeah. copyright and, and copy stuff anyway uh, but of course in the case of software it doesn't really help if you don't have access to the source code in the first place uh, so after a while after a while, Stallman uh, did uh, uh, realize uh, that actually copyright legislation isn't bad, it's neutral, uh, and it's powerful in a way that uh, uh, 
if you are the author of software, uh, you actually, as the author, have, uh, have the power to license your software any way you want. And, uh, and closed source software is just one option that the commercial vendors have started using. So, yeah, basically it's like uh, programmers are superheroes who can choose to use their powers for good or evil when, when they choose licensing, I mean. And, uh, and this, led to the, this, this led to the idea of the GPL license where you publish software under a license saying that I am sharing my source code with you and also you are compelled to share source code uh, with me and, and with uh, the other users and developers in the community. Another name for copyleft licenses is uh, also uh, basic procal licenses. I like copyleft, which, uh, which is the original term. It's kind of the opposite of copyright, although copyleft licenses actually depend on copyright. So this was a significant innovation by Stallman. Uh, I, I rate it uh, you know, at the same level as internet, uh, cloud computing. Uh, uh, GPL license has been an innovation that changed the trajectory of the entire software industry fundamentally. And uh, yeah, we all, I, I'm using a Linux laptop uh, to record this. Actually, I, I wonder if also the software I'm using is GPL licensed. Um, and that there is so much, uh, and e even like internet and cloud computing itself depend on these technologies that we develop as open source, and many of them in the 80s and 90s were under the GPL, uh, which at the time was the most popular open source license. So, for the purpose of this talk, it feels like, you know, if, if it was such a good idea and has been su so successful, makes sense to discuss that can, can we apply this same principle more broadly to new areas uh, which maybe are not covered today uh, and in fact we already know that uh, because there are there is like a spectrum of copyleft licenses available anyway uh, so GPL is the most popular one uh, which was based on this idea that you, you have to share source code to, together with the software uh, but uh, then uh, LGPL uh, uh, the lesser GPL was uh, uh, was narrower. The scope of the license is narrower, so you you have to keep the source code of the LGPL related software open, but it doesn't uh, expand into a larger program. Uh, and then on the other hand, the AGPL, Afero GPL, uh, of course, was created for for network programs uh, where uh, where you don't necessarily copy or install the software to use it, you just use it over the network and the Free Software Foundation uh, wanted to also uh, provide an alternative where users of, uh, of software as a service uh, would be entitled to source code, uh, which uh, is the copyleft principle. So, so it makes sense to ask, is there something beyond this spectrum where uh, where there could be even more areas that, uh, that we could uh, have licenses for. And uh, that's why I want to quickly go through these uh, three licenses that I mentioned. And uh, let's start with the cryptographic uh, autonomy license, which is uh, available and approved as an open source license today. So we have already uh, made this expansion in one direction. The cryptographic autonomy license uh, was submitted uh, by and, and authored by uh, Van Lindbergh uh, <coughs> and commissioned by a company called Holochain, which is a, a startup in the blockchain industry. Uh, and, and maybe the license actually has some features uh, specifically interesting to uh, like distributed peer to peer network. I'm actually not uh, going to focus on that today. Uh, but I, I can't help noticing that it, it seems that this license uh, perpetuates this, uh, this common overloading where anything that uses a blockchain is called crypto, such as cryptocurrencies and so on. Uh, because there is nothing particularly cryptographic about this license. I, I think it's a good network copyleft license or, or software as a service license. Uh, 
which also could, could be used for blockchain. Uh, so uh, the name has raised some questions, I think, when, when people uh, can come to this license. Uh, it also uh, addresses several issues with the AGPL, we, where, which have been seen like awkward or, or maybe even limited in the AGPL. Uh, I, I will return to some of those later. Uh, but the main focus now for the cryptographic autonomy license is introduced, uh, introduced copyleft also for user data. And uh, I'm going to see if my uh, grill is warm uh, so we can talk about user data in uh, network uh, software services. In addition to providing each recipient the opportunity to have access to the source code, you cannot use the permissions given under this license to interfere with recipient's ability to fully use an independent copy of the work generated from the source code you provide with the recipient's own user data. Uh, so, and user data means any data that is an input to or an output from the work. So, first of all, it's worth noting this is actually very similar to the GDPR. Uh, uh, requirements uh, that you have in Europe, which was one point uh, I brought out uh, when uh, when we were reviewing this license on the OSI list. That uh, in some ways it's not a huge burden uh, in some jurisdictions where you have to provide this anyway. So the point of this license uh, is is kind of uh, uh, that uh, what what. If somebody uh, is offering a software as a service, social network or, or some productivity software, then uh, yeah, sure, you can, uh, you can offer users the source code, but because you have all their data, you're never going to migrate to another service anyway, because without it, it's kind of like uh, here uh, in my grill, what if the license guarantees that, yeah, you, you can take uh, the rest of the coal and do make your own barbecue if you want, but the meat has to stay locked uh, in this grill. So there is nothing for me to barbecue uh, under those conditions. I think this is ready. Let's, let's take the meat out of the grill anyway. So, questions when reviewing the license, uh, is it possible legally? Absolutely. You, you, a software license uh, can have all kinds of conditions. Uh, you can only use this if you're a student. You cannot use this in some countries where, uh, which are embargoed. Uh, you can only use this on a particular weekday. Uh, but of course, in open source licenses, the question is, uh, does it comply with the so-called open source definition? Uh, and one principle then is that open source licenses shouldn't have additional conditions that have nothing to do with the software. So, for example, there cannot be a license saying uh, you can use this software freely, but you have to go and take a swim each morning because it's healthy for you. Because that's not a condition that has any relevance to the license. So. There was a lot of discussion, is user data relevant to the, providing user data relevant to the software or not? OSI decided yes, but uh, the revised version of the CAL is actually very narrowly scoped. So it's very clear that the, the reason you have to provide user data is, is solely to provide uh, the software freedom to the user uh, to use it with this specific software, uh, which is licensed. So, uh, personally, I was glad it was approved uh, because now we have expanded uh, the concept of copyleft to also provide user data.
What about software services now? If we think about the social network, all your friends are there. You can get your data. You can get the source code. What are you going to do with them? Uh, you're going to have your own social network with no friends. But this is a concept called network effects, where if some uh, some service has a lot of users, uh, it kind of gravitates by gravitation pulls in more users. For example, uh, in the antitrust uh, investigations with Microsoft and Microsoft Office, if everybody else uses Microsoft Office, you need to be able to open those files, so you have to use Microsoft Office as well. So we still need a copyleft license for friends. I don't know how it's going to work. Welcome to my kids' tree hut, where we will talk about MongoDB server-side public license. Um, I must first make a disclosure. As many of you know, I did work for MongoDB at the time, uh, but I wasn't involved in this process in any way. I live seven time zones away from the MongoDB headquarters, so uh, I, I generally wasn't involved in, in any topics on, on this kind of strategic level. Uh, nevertheless, I, I want to be a bit careful and, and mindful uh, because I was an employee at the time. Uh, so, so the next few minutes will basically just be publicly available facts. I, I'm not uh, going to express a personal opinion for or against, uh, except uh, when once we get back to talking about AGPL uh, in general. So SSPL was uh, submitted to OSI in uh, October 2018. And the context here is important. Uh, this happened at the time where uh, a lot of other database vendors also switched their li open source license to some other licenses, some of which them they wrote themselves uh, or, or just became more closed source. Uh, a lot of different uh, approaches uh, were seen. And uh, MongoDB uh, MongoDB at this point uh, uh, was the only one who at least attempted uh, to create a new open source license and submit it for approval for the OSI. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, I, I think it's still uh, relevant uh, for this kind of talk. Um, in general, uh, at the time, I, I think it's good to note for that uh, a lot of these other companies were very critical about Amazon in particular. They felt that their revenues were threatened by Amazon, who could take their software for free. Uh, and they would do all the development, but Amazon would get most of the money. Uh, in when MongoDB submitted this license, uh, they, they never actually mentioned Amazon or some other vendor by name. Uh, and the submission was more of a technical nature, uh, talking about microservice architectures or distributed databases and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it seems like the most of the reviewers did criticize them for uh, not, uh, yeah, not, not treating uh, public cloud uh, vendors equally. And uh, it was interpreted that the license was created uh, to, to essentially act as a poison pill uh, against cloud vendors. So I, I think the American say, uh, saying here is that if it, uh, if it walks like a duck and it looks like a duck, then it's a duck. Uh, uh, so the outcome was that uh, uh, the license was never approved. Uh, so uh, what the SSSP SSPL uh, did, uh, it's actually based on the AGPL license and it simply uh, rewrote uh, paragraph 13, wh which is also the unique paragraph in AGPL, which has to do with uh, uh, with uh, the, the network aspect uh, of the copyleft. Uh, and, and SSPL and MongoDB argued that um, AGPL uh, doesn't work for something like a distributed database. And it doesn't work for a cloud service that's based on multiple microservices. Uh, because GPL and AGPL uh, basically are written uh, as if all software is a single process running on a single server. Uh, 
but okay, their attempt to, to redefine the scope of what is a service uh, got a lot of criticism and, uh, and eventually the discussion ended. So uh, it, that's about all I can say about MongoDB and the SSPL license. But uh, let's talk about AGPL uh, and, and this paragraph 13. So uh, the, the key point here is uh, the part where I say if, if you modify the program, your modified version must prominently offer all users interacting with it remotely through a computer network. So, so this means probably I'm using software as a service or, or some kind of social network or game, any, anything that you could use, uh, a blog software. Uh, that you can use uh, with the browser over a network. Uh, so the first criticism against AGPL is it seems to assume that there is some kind of user interface to interact with. So what if I develop a database, not even a distributed one, uh, and the database is used as part of some other software, users are not actually interacting with it, but it is part of the larger service uh, that users interact. Uh, does the AGPL then not apply uh, to this kind of database or, or lower level uh, library software? Uh, in my opinion, it's not wrong of authors of such software to expect that they should have a kind of network copyleft benefits as well. So uh, the, the cryptographic autonomy license actually did address this and uh, it's written in a way that uh, it doesn't depend on, on the software having a user interface for example or or it doesn't depend on a specific way uh, for the network interaction. It just says that you have to provide the source code to your users, and it's you know it doesn't matter what uh, what technical what the technical circumstances are. Uh, you just have to make sure that you do it. Uh, so uh, that's another reason I, I did like uh, the, the call. Uh, maybe I, I think it's actually more important than the user data provision even to, to address this. The other point which I don't think the CAL addresses and, and maybe we are not ready to, to define what is the scope of a web service. Uh, this is what MongoDB uh, tried, to, uh, tried to do with the SSPL. Uh, this is a good case where it's difficult to write uh, a solid legal text defining what is part of a web service consisting of multiple microservices calling each other over rest or something else uh, and what is not like I don't know your your disk uh, uh, block, block service that you use as a disk or the compute service that starts your operating system in an instances um, so it, it has to stop somewhere and the GPL uh, and a GPL in fact have this kind of system library exception uh, so it's it's kind of well understood there that what is the scope of GPL and AGPL. For a distributed system, it's kind of harder because everything is distributed, but intuitively we can say that, okay, these microservices do actually belong together and these other are generic system services. Uh, I think it would be great uh, if we could have, uh, have a license which could capture this concept of a program uh, which isn't a single process running on a single server. Uh, hopefully we will see such license in the future. So the last license to discuss was Facebook's patent clause that they used for React, eventually for RocksDB and a lot of other software as well. Uh, they used it for many years, but then in 2017 started drawing attention for some reason and uh, other open source users of React, uh, in the end also Apache Foundation commented that it, you can't amend open source licenses, in this case it was BSD plus a patent clause. What Facebook had added was a patent termination clause, which actually isn't unheard of. Uh, now when I looked into it, it's, uh, it's kind of similar to what you would see in the Apache license, for example. Uh, but of course it was written with, with Facebook hard-coded, so only, only Facebook benefited from this termination clause, other React developers would not. So it uh, of course wouldn't work as an open source license. 
Honestly, I have no idea why Facebook doesn't just use the Apache license. It, it seems to do roughly the same as they wanted to do. Uh, anyway, uh, let's talk about patent clauses. Uh, so if we look at the Apache license, for example, uh, and to some extent uh, GPL3 is the same, uh, they seem to be very narrowly scoped. Essentially, uh, Apache and GPL grant the minimum amount of patent rights uh, that you, of course, need to be able to use the software in the first place. Otherwise, the license would be incomplete uh, if you would need to get like a separate patent license. Uh, it wouldn't be open source compliant for sure. So in the Apache license, such license applies only to those patent claims licensable by such contributors that are necessarily infringed by the contributions. GPL has this concept of essential patent claims uh, are that do not do not include claims that would be infringing only as a consequence of further modification of the contributor version. So basically saying that, uh, yeah, I, I license this software for you, and I license all my patents that you need for this software, but if you make any modifications, then actually uh, my, my license might not cover your modifications. Personally, I think this is not very open source. This was, these licenses were created or influenced by lawyers of large companies, uh, yeah, were la large patent holders, I should say, who benefit from only giving a very narrow license to their patents. Other contributors, I think, would benefit from uh, a broader patent pool. In the spirit of uh, Open Invention Network, for example, which actually is a patent pool that anybody can join, uh, and it's kind of a patent truce for Linux and a lot of other open source software. But Open Invention Network is still a, a closed list, so the compa big companies who created it at first define which software they, they want to create this kind of patent truce for. So for example, Linux uh, is of course part of it. Uh, last time I looked, the BSD uh, Unixes weren't. Uh, and so on. When uh, uh, when I worked for MariaDB, we looked into this, uh, and it did cover MySQL, but MariaDB, of course, wasn't listed, so it wasn't clear whether we would have any benefit for, uh, to join. Later, actually, MariaDB has joined, and it was added to the list. I think, uh, you know, the, in the concept uh, that we're talking about in this talk, I think it would be great if a license such as GPL uh, would apply the copyleft uh, expansive principle to patents as well. At least uh, if you agree with me that software patents are harmful and, and we should uh, try to fight against them, I think this could be a powerful tool. Let's say, uh, you know, if, if at, at minimum, you know, if, if I get uh, GPL licensed software from you and I make some small modifications, I should still be covered and, and not uh, risk patent suits from you. Especially if I then contribute my modifications back to you, so you can use them and I can. But I think uh, we could go even further. Uh, you know, there could even be a license which says that any software, kind of in the spirit of what Facebook tried to do uh, for to benefit themselves, we could say that there would be a license where any software uh, licensed under this license, e even if it would be completely separate things. One would be an operating system, another thing would be like a JavaScript uh, library. Uh, if you use any of these software licensed under this license, uh, then you you are also prohibited from bringing patent suits against anybody uh, else contributing uh, that have contributed software under this license. Uh, it's a thought that excites me. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to excite uh, those who uh, who create new licenses, uh, but uh, uh, maybe uh, through this talk, uh, I could have inspired somebody to at least think about it. So, in uh, in summary, uh, the cryptographic autonomy license, or the CAL, I think we can call it, extends copyleft to user data. Uh, 
much in the spirit of the GDPR, but also outside of Europe. Uh, it also addresses some other issues with the AGPL, so it doesn't assume uh, that your software has a user interface, for example. Uh, copyleft for microservice architectures, I think, is still uh, an unsolved problem. Let's talk about it more. And copyleft for patents, I, I think, is something that we should, uh, we should attack. The large patent holders are not going to do it for us. Uh, so we, we should have licenses where the patent license is more than just for essential claims. So uh, I'm uh, available for questions. We can talk about it in the hallway track. Uh, grab a drink. I, I like a lemon soda. And I look forward to, to discussing with you. Thank you for listening. Uh, yeah, so I think we had a lot of commentary on the why patent clauses are the way they are. Let, let me check the shared notes. Do, do we have like some actual questions or should we just jump into a debate here? So we had one question from McCoy Smith that you yeah. did already answer in the chat. I have um, put those here and then one other one added in here. Historically, GPL has not been litigated much in courts. What makes you think that more expansive copyleft licenses would be effective in achieving what they are trying to achieve? That's a good question. And, and the answer is that the GPL has worked even if it's not litigated in courts. And uh, I, I guess I've worked for some unnamed companies who also stretched the GPL further than uh, maybe it should have. And that also works because uh, companies generally want to avoid getting into court battles at all. So uh, I, I think in, in pushing boundaries, uh, in this case for good, not for evil, as superheroes, uh, it, it can be a powerful tool. And, and whether some things would work in court, it's a question you can ask, but it's not the most important question. I see another question got added. Ah. Another direction in which extreme copy <coughs> is going is ethical licensing. But if this was mentioned in the talk, I missed it. Might be useful to otherwise mention. Uh, yes, a uh, great question because uh, the ethical licenses uh, have indeed been a, a topic in recent years. Uh, I, I think in the talk uh, uh, with the, I, I, I spoke a little bit uh, about uh, reviewing the cryptographic autonomy license on the OSI review mailing list. And uh, uh, there, uh, I, I think there was a very clear requirement that uh, uh, the, the terms of an open source license have to somehow relate to the software. So, uh, so in the case of the CAL license, uh, the question was if, if we add some requirements on the data stored by the software or produced by the software, is that going too far? And, uh, and I, I think the reviewers were quite strict on this question that in a way, uh, you should not have terms outside of the like what is needed to use the software, and and that's it. So, so also in terms of user data, uh, there was a clear consensus that you you generally should not be able to restrict um, ownership of uh, of you of data produced by some software and. Uh, or what you can do with it, how, how you can publish it, for example, or, or copy it, distribute it. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the idea that in modern networked world, if, if you want to copy, uh, if you want to use your software freedom rights to, uh, to copy the software and run it uh, somewhere else, uh, you should be able to then have your your data with it. So, 
So that was uh, th that was an interesting kind of border case. So so with ethical licenses, typically, it's hard to see, uh, let's say, a word processor or a database. Uh, how has does it have anything to do with uh, you know my my ethical values, and e even if I behave badly, uh, or, e or or in fact, uh, sometimes the discussion is. Uh, uh, and, and part of the principles of the open source division uh, definition is that I, I can even use your open source software uh, for purposes that you would think are unethical. Uh, I, I would even think are unethical. Uh, and uh, that, that is certainly a principle of open source. So, so we, uh, we cannot limit use of software uh, and we cannot have unrelated uh, unrelated uh, requirements like you know you, you should eat oatmeal every morning before you use this software uh, so that that might be healthy uh, and maybe ethical uh, but it's it's not possible for open source software thanks Enrico go ahead and read the next question that's listed in the shared notes um, would it perhaps make sense to look at this new set of problems as part of a holistic revamp? of the new licenses with a version four set of licenses? Yeah, yeah I, I think it would make sense. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, if you look at the uh, the process that led to GPL3, uh, so for example, uh, it did add a patent clause and, and, uh, and the patent clause is definitely very narrow. So I, I'm not sure uh, that uh, such a mainstream license should or could or should adopt my views that may, may be more likely that some new license would uh, attempt this and it would be interesting to even see the reaction if such license is submitted for uh, approval at the OSI. Um, I, I, I think it's uh, I, I think it's perfectly fine uh, for for GPL and the family of new licenses uh, to be a bit more conservative, uh, to to appeal to a broader base, uh, especially as some existing software might be upgraded to the new version. So, so I think it's also important that users and developers have some expectation of continuity uh, when when they use software and with open source licenses. Ah, oh, Toby, uh, <laughs> Toby noticed the continuation with the drink. I almost forgot it, to be honest. Uh, okay, uh, I should call this out. Ma McCoy Smith uh, is mentioning that there is a presentation on ethical licensing later in the conference. Uh, okay, and here is something. Uh, so, uh, from Wan Lee, cryptographic autonomy is a term used by a number of people to describe the ability to absolutely control one's keys and data. Uh, so, sort of the opposite of DRM. So, so yes, I, I think if uh, if one reads the the CAL license, uh, it does have paragraphs about uh, like restrictions about using uh, cryptographic keys uh, for DRM purposes, for example. So, from that point of view, uh, I, I could understand the name of the license. Um, I, I think it has that's like GPL has similar process as well, so I, I think CAL is actually a good general purpose license, whether or not you use crypto, cryptography in your software. But, uh, but okay, so, so the point is, if, if you think about cryptographic autonomy as the opposite of DRM, uh, uh, that, that's actually a good summary of the CAL. Thank you. Uh, yeah, McCoy also discusses uh, ethical licenses and issues with uh, points five and six in the open source definition usually it's quite straightforward to see how they go against this that is all of the chat no, nobody is bold enough to turn on their camera maybe toast um, yeah so so there is more on, on cryptographic autonomy so that, that is why the focus was always about allowing self-hosting with no loss of functionality or data uh, so I, I get that part. I, I think DRM is just one thing that could limit that. 
Yes. Uh, so I, I actually haven't posted the slides yet. I, I need to do it uh, later, I think. There weren't so many slides. Well, Jeff uh, is asking, why do you think we haven't had more of a A dash FGPL culture copy left in the library world, bottom up approach instead of top down AGPL based first? I, I think the question is whether the, I'm not sure if this is what you meant, but an interesting question is uh, could we use uh, these more, these stronger copyleft licenses such as Afero GPL also for libraries where typically libraries are more permissively licensed and applications might be more extreme uh, I y yes as an extremist with, with my extremist hat on we we should have done that uh, so I, I think uh, in the real world though uh, these choices are are made on a kind of benef calculating the benefit that uh, if you go too far you don't get many users um, if you choose a more permissive license it can be used more broadly and that's also good for software freedom um, with the AGPL in particular uh, as I discussed in the talk uh, it, it is written in a way uh, which seems to assume that the software has a user interface. So if I would use it for a library, um, is it even effective? Uh, so I, I think I would use then, in, indeed, I would use the Cal, or what, uh, there are some other um, network copyleft licenses approved previously by the OSI that uh, that could also come into play. Uh, that uh, that seemed to be more general purpose in this regard. Uh, 